Uh, I'm really glad that everybody has come today too. Thank you so much. I love having a uh, live feed for interviews. I think we realize that that's actually kind of the way to go because you all get to interact as well. And that's really the big thing right now is trying to diversify people's interest in the SCA and get a new scope of all of the different sciences and even arts that are out there as well. So today I am with Issa Kenyon Donacade. I'm getting better at it every time. Nailed it. <laughs> and she is here to give us, I, I, I'm going to say it's an interview slash sort of lecture about, uh, I think we called it Where's the Midwife? And uh, we picked, or I picked that at that um, particular image because I felt like the priest to the side was like, oh, shit. I don't know what to do right now. So get me a woman to fix the problem that's in the room. Uh, before I go on, we're going to talk about vaginas and probably maybe penises. There's going to be sex, witchery. Uh, I said mules, which there will be, I promise. And, um, you know, an adult conversation. So if you are uncomfortable with that, um, it's not going to be gross or you know over the top we're not showing a porn here today um but you want to i mean i don't you're not you don't have a porn presented today right i was in that class but no no porn this morning sure. all right so uh but i do want everybody to be aware that it is maybe sensitive topics for some people and give them the opportunity to out if they start watching this video at a later date or perhaps they weren't sure what they were getting into when they came uh to this live feed so uh, for midwifery, I think it's probably the most important role that a woman had um, during our entire SEA period, and even today. I mean, they're still very important in modern world. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you, why do you think for so long that healing has been specifically a woman's task? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that healing has come out of the giving of care and for a long time it has been the matriarchs that have cared for the family uh, and true to that in a lot of our SCA time frame um, if you were sick you didn't necessarily call a physician you called your mom or your auntie or your grandma or the neighbor lady uh, because that uh, healing of, of illness and day-to-day -day small injury was absolutely kept within the home. Whereas if you had access to someone who had had uh, training to be a physician or a surgeon um, that may not be in your area geographically, uh, you may not have economic access to that. Um, and they were just hard to come by. So they were, reserved i think for people one who had access and then uh two who were you know truly having a a really intense injury or illness everyday healing for colds and coughs was absolutely done at home and i think that that then uh once we see post plague especially in europe um where we were i think it was like eight times or something like that more likely uh, we, as in we, as a woman, were way more likely to survive the plague, and then we lost huge swaths of our population in Europe, a lot of them men, and we had to come in as women, and we had to fill those those economic gaps. And part of that was you start to see places where we get to exercise more economic agency over our lives because now we can have a job. And a lot of those jobs came under this umbrella of care. So it, it, I'm gonna move on sort of keeping with that, keeping the idea that midwifery is important for women, they've done it for ages, healing in general for ages. Why are vaginas evil then? And I say that, <laughs> because why was the church so terrified of our vagina? And then more so, it seems men also were terrified of the vagina. What powers did it hold over them that scared them so much, yet the woman was the people they called in to heal them anyway? So what, what caused this counter? 
That that is a fantastic um, connection to to make there. Um, I would answer first. Why why do we think that men were I, at least according to a lot of the documentation, why why would men be scared of vaginas? Well, I have to say I can't blame them considering the things that were being put out by the church. Um, and and I, I don't mean to church bash for the Middle Ages, but there's going to be some church bashing uh, because we have a lot of monks and clergy who I don't know their lives. I don't want to speak to their personal lives, but from some of the things that were stated and particularly um, that once they were written down, they were perpetuated. Um, I question how much interaction they had personally with a vagina in real life. Um, and I think that it stemmed out of this need to be chased at all time. And that spanned time and space within the Christian church uh, that we see after the fall of Rome, all the way up until the latter part of the Middle Ages. Um, you see chastity is elevated even within, the, within a proper church marriage. Um, there are even passages that I have read that talk about how a woman was she was she was elevated she was she was seen as as being higher than if she was entirely disgusted with the idea of having sex um which is just there's so much to unpack there uh but that that um that disdain and fear of our our anatomy because it was more than just, I mean, it emanated from the vagina, but it also emanated from our eyes, right? So like, for example, um, if you read that if a woman was having her menses and that created an evil poison gas that would seep out of her eyes, and if you made eye contact or even happened to look in her direction and you caught that, it would cause cancer and leprosy and you would be impotent for the rest of your life and you would fall ill instantly and that there was no cure for these things. Of course, they were scared of us. And what's interesting to me about the fact that they then would also, as you said, and, and accurately so that they would turn to us for care, those who were seen as the most evil and the most poisonous and toxic were, were um, a low economic class, were prostitutes, uh, were older women, especially ones who no longer had a husband, which I find fascinating. So the women who were deemed as a little bit safer were the ones who were within that primo age. So you're an adult, which could probably be about 13 or 14, um, all the way up to you know, your your elder years. Uh, you had access to good, nutritious food. You probably had some money. You probably had a man of the house. Those were the safe ladies for the most part, as long as they were chased. I mean, things can go sideways at any point because if you are a woman who menstruates, that stuff is toxic. But um, there was a, a little bit more agency there for those within that particular socioeconomic class uh, to be able to be seen as cleaner and, and more safe than if you had to work for a living or if you were older or widowed, things like that. So I have to, I have to wonder then, is that where the stigma of, uh, from, from the older individuals that you're talking about who aren't in that primo class, uh, being sort of through time considered witches, right? Those are, you always get that old crone, that hag uh, yeah. that pops up. So I'm gonna guess you think that's probably where that comes from too, right? Like as it went through history? You know, I'm not sure. Um, I honestly haven't thought about that. I, I, I do think you're onto something there though. Um, if we look at the records of the women who were persecuted for witchcraft, um, especially for myself, I tend to focus more on England and Scotland and Ireland. And among those, real heavy into Scotland, uh, people who know me will not be surprised by that. Um, and we see ages that span. So what we see, what I have seen pretty often is once you have one individual who is accused and 
if, if she is, if she's found to be guilty, really, really bad. But you have one individual who is found to be a witch and then every woman within her family is then also implicated. So uh, if you had an older mom and she had an adult daughter or vice versa, they're going to be pulled into all of that. Um, and there was, there was a lot of, you know, you want to be perfect, but you don't want to be too perfect because then you're going to get accused of witchcraft. But then you also don't want to be on the fringe because then you're going to get accused of witchcraft. And um, there were, of course, because I don't want to to over simplify because I, I think that happens far too often. There were a lot, again, not to continually harp on economics, but I find that socioeconomics has a huge impact on what has impacted our gender historically to, you know, forever. Um, there was a lot of economic incentive to accuse someone of witchcraft, especially once again by the church. Uh, that was a wonderful way that they could seize your land and your assets. So if you were a woman who was widowed, you no longer have a man to be able to speak for you. And that is something that unfortunately in a lot of avenues was required where you were unable to speak for yourself, or maybe it was harder for you to find work, but you had in, inherited these assets. That was a very easy way for those to be taken away from you. You are an easy target. That makes sense. Um, back to the church on this subject, uh, how did the church regulate sexual activity? Because it seems like they sort of had a hand in almost all aspects of it, starting from royalty, going all the way down to, as you said, um, they had expectations of a chaste woman, even into the poverty levels. So how did they regulate it? What did they do to keep it in check? That's, that's a really good question. Uh, what did they do to keep it in check? Um, there were certainly repercussions for being too lusty. Um, I, I think one of my favorite classes that I've taught was actually on all of the ways that it would hinder and harm you if you happen to be a woman who also enjoyed having sex. Um, if you had any signs of lust whatsoever, um, they could, they created, I, I should say, they created a system in which you were, you now had a disease, you now had a demon, you were evil, you were of the devil. Uh, and they found ways through the social consequences and ostracizing those women to help to keep them in check. And if you ostracize the women and you make them evil and you make them toxic, then the men don't want to have sex with them anymore. Um, which is interesting in and of itself because did men stop having sex? No. Were men in any way ostracized or have to suffer any social consequences whatsoever for going to a whore or going to a brothel? No. And I want to make a point here that when I use terms like whore or prostitute, that those are words that were used at the time. Um, and there are words that I think, especially within our hobby, are now starting to be reclaimed. Um, so I just wanted to give a little overarching view there. If there was... Um, I didn't want to give anyone who is maybe new to me talking about these topics to think that that, that is in any way derogatory. Right, right. Um, so I, I'm going to, I don't know if this fits exactly into where we're at right now, but I had this, this question and when I looked at it, I thought, what is this? Can you tell me what the wandering womb theory is? What, what, what is that? I, this is my favorite medical theory within all of, of historical gynecology. So in a nutshell, high level overview, the uterus is what they call the womb, essentially. They didn't have a real firm grasp on anatomy. There weren't a lot of dissections going on, at least within the Western Europe, uh, Christian traditions. We definitely saw it elsewhere. Um, <laughs> I love the comments that I'm getting in the chat, sorry. Um, <laughs> so your uterus has two interesting features about it. One is that it does, it is not necessarily held in place by anything within your body. And two, it has a sense of smell. So since your womb is not fixed, it is free 
to roam about your body. But of course, when it does, it causes all sorts of repercussions. Uh, for example, if it were to wander all the way up into your head, it could cause you epilepsy. If it wandered too far, and I'm gonna get this wrong if it's left or right, but I think it's too far up into the right, maybe left, where's the liver? I think it's, I don't know. Anyway, if it came too far up and it were to press against the liver, that would then come up and press against your lungs, and now you're you're not able to breathe. Up and to the right, thank you. I didn't study for this part of the pop quiz. Um, so then you're unable to have a full breath. You're gonna you're gonna have some labored breathing. So what we need to do is we need to pull that wound back in the place where it ought to be. So how we do that is, as I said, we're going to we're going to capitalize on the fact that it has a sense of smell and we are gonna steam sweet things under the vagina. And we're also going to put putrid things on your face. So the way that's going to look in practice is you are gonna have something like a earthing stool or sometimes lying down, but it's hard to do. And you would have a pot that probably looked a lot like this. This is a recreation that Master Edric made for me when I was able to give him some sketches out of the margins of manuscripts that came out of Arabic texts um, uh, about these, these exact gynecological ailments. So um, you would steam sweet herbs in water in something like this. And as, as you can see here, it has, a, it has a stand where you would put the hot coals or you would have this over the fire. All of your medicinals are in here and it's going to steam up the funnel, which then you're going to hover under. And this is going to provide those sweet smells and healing um, and nurturing herbs to the vulva. And at the same time, uh, you are gonna put any number of recipes for things either in your nose, on your face. Uh, one example, I, be I believe it's in the Trotula. Uh, it could be Albertus Magnus, but I'm like 99% sure it's Trota herself uh, wrote the recipe for taking the soles of a man's old pair of work shoes and you boil that in water and then you have to steam your face with it because it smells nasty. And so if the uterus is up too high, it's going to smell that and it's gonna scurry back down and it's also gonna be attracted by those sweet smells. So you have a pull and push that's going to bring the uterus back down. Now, to come full circle with the um, ailment of lust as a woman, um, there are cases that are documented in period manuscripts in which the woman had her uterus sort of fly away about her body uh, because she became uh, too, I want to say hot and dry. This is gonna fall into the humors, uh, but it was caused by her, her lack of having sex. And so all of her lust went unaccounted for and it caused her this incredible imbalance um, that caused her uterus to wander and it was up against her liver. So all of her doctors came in who coincidentally at this time happened to be men who were writing this down saying She's, she needs to bang this out. So she gets to have sex with whoever she wants and whoever this is, they, they cannot turn her down because this is a matter of life and death. So, I mean, if you ever get a little faint or a little short of breath, there's your cure is to pick the man who is going to alleviate you of your your wandering womb ailments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, did they happen to be churchmen at all? I'm just curious. Priests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thought, I figured as much. Okay. Um, yeah, the Victorians also. You know, someone mentioned it. Hysteria. Um, yeah. I, have to wonder, I wonder. I just have to wonder how many women came in for not only hysteria for themselves. Uh, but the doctors probably encouraged hysteria too. Um, so I, I, I'm going to kind of move on to uh, the wandering womb theory is, is interesting, but I want to know more about this pot. And this is maybe a stupid question on my part, but you said uh, that the, the steam just comes out, right? And for whatever reason, the longest time when you showed me this, I guess as perverted as this might be, I thought you actually like insert. Yeah, like you drove down onto it. Is that not the case? Oh, so, 
I don't, I don't believe so. And the reason why, and I think that's a very reasonable and logical assumption to make con considering the shape of this thing. Um, <laughs> and, and not only that, but I, I have the same issue. And I have this issue a lot when they talk about steaming. Um, they refer to kind of everything that's going on as the matrix, which I'm sure there are jokes there about our reproductive organs being the matrix. But I have also questioned how the steam is supposed to reach all of these places within the internal body. Uh, we do have to keep in mind, though, that they essentially thought that everything in the torso, at least in a woman, was pretty much just like open space and everything just kind of hung out and moved around. Um, the pot itself gets hot when you steam, so it would absolutely burn to the touch. Um, the other reason why I don't think that you would insert um, is because we do have some images out of uh, quite a few of the manuscripts that show the, show the patient either in something like a birthing chair or lying down, but sometimes they kind of like float it's weird. Like maybe they're on a cot or a hammock and then the fire and the steam pot is, is underneath them. So taking all of that um, and sort of aggregating all of that together, it's my determination that they probably didn't insert it. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a perfectly valid question. It would make more sense to get the steam to the womb that way. I'm not even sure with how like airlocks work. Like if anyone here has ever used a menstrual cup, um, I'm not sure that the steam would even rise the same way if it was inserted. It The whole thing is kind of um, trial and error. Your mileage may vary. Gotcha. So you mentioned uh, chastity or a woman being chased. And, I, you know, I kind of that just makes me think about like a chastity bell and how important virginity was to men. Um, and I guess also the church as well. Uh, one time I remember you telling me and I'm curious if you this is a recipe that you would have used in the steam pot. You told me about um, a recipe where there was like a caustic acid of some kind that they use on the vagina to tighten the vagina up. Was that what they would have used in that steam pot also, or was that something different? I have something for you. This is why I keep my herbs handy. So there were quite a few caustic substances that, that they would have used um, to make the vagina constrict. Um, anything with sort of an astringent property was, was thought to be able to achieve this. There are quite a few recipes and some are absolutely used in the steam pot. Uh, some are used as a wash and some are used as an insert um, that would allow the woman to essentially fake her virginity. Um, and one of the most common caustic substances that you see is lead. Um, and it is described as litharge in the documentation, which is a lead oxide. And I actually have some here. Uh, you can get this if you wanna play with it. Although be very careful, I'm giving a huge discussion here about this stuff. This is available through um, the same sites where you would get stuff for like a science classroom and other teaching tools or chemistry sites. Um, the, the problem with this, and I'm gonna hold it up to the camera, hopefully so you guys can read this a little bit. Uh, this is highly toxic and highly caustic. You uh, do not want to breathe this in. So you wanna be maybe outside someplace with uh, a lot of airflow and ventilation. You don't wanna get it on your hands because it will burn your skin. And then there are also tons, and I might have this up on my blog. I don't know if I have it in a blog post that's um, already out and published, but I will make sure to put it up. There are tons of EPA um, requirements too for then how to dispose of this when, when you're done. So uh, just to give a little bit of food for thought there that something that has that amount of EPA requirements around it and how much protective equipment you have to wear to work with it they would put this directly into their vaginas, according to the manuscripts. This is one of those things that I see it everywhere. And 
simultaneously my heart breaks for any women who were told to do this by their physicians and have done so. And then at the same time, it makes me question how often this was actually used by maybe especially a physician once we get to the time that they were actually trained um, in, in the schools after 11th, 12th centuries, um, if they were themselves actually prescribing this, knowing how how bad the side effects were going to be, I'll say it that way. Yeah, I, I, I had so many questions about this. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go down this this weird path for a second. So, uh, so they pour this on because they want to, you know, give the impression of virginity. So, how long after they poured this caustic chemical onto themselves did they wait before they took part in sex because now I have this question of was it like 10 minutes after when you're raw and possibly bleeding inside that this is ah that's that's fantastic um <laughs> that's my interpretation anyway because this is going to constrict um and it's going to increase a lot of the blood flow and so that's going to give you um not only the constriction, but also bleeding, and bleeding is a sign of having popped your hymen. Ah. So why, did they believe that being a virgin? Okay, so we we know that it's a big deal, you know, or at least history, or um, I guess maybe fantasy movies, uh, historical fictions, uh, and I guess probably also history itself, documented history that. Uh, you want to marry a virgin. What was the big hang up about that? What made a virgin so great? I mean, it's a virgin one time, right? So like, why was she this perfect thing first? And now does she become imperfect after that? Does she, does she lose less value because she's not a virgin any longer? Did they think that it gave them some kind of power to procreate faster or more efficiently on the first night? Uh, what, what do you think that was all about? That's a really interesting question. There, I think there's a couple of questions there. So if you are a virgin, then it would be, I would say, assumed or inferred that you would hold chastity as one of your one of your values, that you yourself were chaste because you do not take part in having sex. Um, so that in and of itself has a lot of value. But then further, something that I think is important to note is that I've done some reading just sort of on the middle class and socioeconomics within Western Europe and the British Islands, especially like the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans. And what I have read there that I find really interesting is that their idea of being a virgin on the wedding night and our idea of being a virgin on the wedding night um, are not entirely the same thing because in our society, and I'm going to speak as someone who was raised in, in the Bible Belt, where I, in fact, have adults in my family who chose to stay a virgin until their wedding night is um, hugely valued and pushed within um, the the church even now. So we have a hang up now about having to be a virgin at the actual party, at the wedding, at the, at the exchanging of the vows, and then you go and have sex. Whereas in a typical socioeconomic, we'll say a low to middle class town in Norman, England, you didn't always have a priest or some other cleric who could perform the ceremony. So once you chose who was going to be your partner, you could at that point start having sex. You would only have sex with each other. And then whenever that guy came around who could perform the ceremony, you would hop on and just do a quick little wedding. Um, and from what I have read, I think some of that, and this what I'm about to say is just the world according to Issa, um, but sort of what, what I have taken from from everything I, I have read is that a lot of that probably also had to do with uh, your heirs and paternity and knowing who the father was as well. Yeah, that makes, I, I saw that Jonah said that, uh, that makes sense too, but that works one time, right? Uh, right. After that, it could be anybody technically. Um, so 
we're kind of moving from chastity, which I guess is technically a contraceptive, if you think about it. Uh, it's complete abstinence, so definitely probably not getting pregnant if you are actually uh, following through with it. But how did abortion work? Um, uh, did did they take drugs or was it again like the caustic chemicals that they inserted hoping for the best? What, what did they use for actual abortive practices? So there were um, a lot of interesting thoughts on how to abort a fetus. Um, some that were very common, um, and I think that this probably has to do with just access, was I've seen just tons of writing, again, spanning time and space uh, within our SEA timeframe that talks about abortion through um, dancing, traveling, um, it, any kind of strenuous activity or movement. Um, and uh, it, I could be lumping things together, but I'm pretty sure I read somewhere. And of course I can't think of the documentation to point you to. Um, it was probably McLaren, the history of contraception or potentially Albertus Magnus. Those are two authors about it a lot. The latter being uh, from within period uh, being a, a primary source that this worked best if you were early, which I find interesting. Um, I have found things about even um, what we would maybe today call tossing yourself down the stairs, um, some, some things that are going to harm the body, but they're going to do so in such a way that it's also going to cause you to have a miscarriage. Um, and then they did also take drugs. There is a lot written down about um, the cup of herbs or the cup of the root is one. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the Talmud. Uh, I, I was reading this book about it. And those are herbs that are drank or eaten in order to cause an abortion. Uh, probably the most common one is rue. And even now, I know, um, I want to say about two years ago, there was this newfound uh, conversation about using herbs to abort because of additionally restrictive law heartbeat bills that were, that were coming up. And I started to see, and it was very disturbing to me, starting to see some of these documents and manuscripts from the Middle Ages that are popping up saying, you know, well, rue and pennyroyal and herbs that I would once again, I'm going to scream at windmills a little bit to please, please not use these things. Um, they 100% will cause an abortion, but you're going to end up in the ICU in the process because they're also going to cause you to go into all kinds of organ failure, which is how they achieve an abortion. So we absolutely know that these things were common. Uh, we also know that the church in a lot of the clerical discourse um, seemed to hesitate to actually put out what the methods were to cause these abortions. I don't know if they knew or not. I, I can see both sides. I can see that maybe they knew exactly what was being done and they didn't wanna be seen as um, perpetuating the knowledge or they may not have known at all because again, I, I have a personal theory that they probably didn't interact very much with women. Um, but there was a lot written down about the prostitutes know, the whores know, it's a secret that all of the women know, all of those evil women know how to do this and it's in, it's in, the, it's in the cup that, that they drink, but it's all very, very hush hush. So obviously, let's we're going to try to avoid, uh, excuse me, avoid abortion because I think uh, they wanted children or individuals to procreate. Having children was important; it was godly. But was there contraception used? Did they have condoms? Did they? Uh, I mean, what what methods did they use to try to keep from getting pregnant if it was something that needed to be done? Right. Yeah. They they used quite a few. I would say the the two that I see the most often at least that are documented, particularly from the church, is going to be coitus interruptus, which is pulling out, as we might call it. Um, and then they also did know to count days. And for as much as they didn't know about our anatomy and our bodies, they seemed probably just through trial and error, they seemed to understand, and they certainly wrote down 
that if you don't want to have a child, you should avoid having sex for the 10 to 14 days that come after her menses have stopped. So they did understand to avoid having sex during ovulation in order to avoid conceiving. Um, additionally, there were some very um, interesting conversations and writings about ways to avoid pregnancy based on your position. So um, I believe it's Albertus Magnus that uh, it was it was written down that whoever's on the bottom is the one who's going to get pregnant, uh, which was also a warning against having the woman on top. Um, they also believed that certain kinds of positions having sex standing up, for example, that you would not be able to conceive because all of the seed is going to fall down, presumably like into her legs rather than go up into the womb. Um, and then they also did use things um, that we would maybe call more of like a prophylaxis method. So one that I brought um, is a vaginal sponge. So the ones that I have here are actual sponges. So they look something like this. And what you would do, this is, I'm gonna squeeze pretty hard and it's, it's kind of stiff. So what you would usually do with something like this is you're going to get it wet and then it's gonna become a lot more pliable and then you would insert this and this is going to absorb the ejaculate so you're not as likely to conceive. Um, when the manuscripts talk about the sponge, depending on the time and place, it can also be talking about something more like lint, uh, which was normally like wool was, was a common one. Um, just a, according to the material that they have, but it would still be called a sponge in, in the writings, and then they would explain that it's a lint of wool. Also out of Egypt, they would, they would call it lint. While we're talking about picking things in the vagina, uh, let's talk about trying to deal with your menses and menstrual flow. Uh, did they have tampons? I know I've seen some uh, random, you know, internet postings about the Egyptians absolutely use tampons. Uh, what about moss? I mean, give me some methods that they would use to um, take care of uh, their menstruation. So uh, one that I think is most common across the ancient and the Middle Ages uh, was absolutely what was called the clout or the cloth. Um, this would not be an insert. This would be worn on the outside a lot like we would wear um, a pad, a maxi pad. It's, it's going to absorb menstruation in that way. Um, there are some writings about also using a sponge to absorb. However, um, it from what I've seen, it looks to be something that they did not, um, they didn't like, they, it, it was not a recommendation from a, a health standpoint. Um, I, I have a very strong personal opinion that they did not use tampons, at least not tampons the way we would think of a tampon. Um, there were a lot of taboos coming out of the medical field, not about inserting things into your vagina. They loved inserting things into the vagina. They would insert anything into your vagina, but not when you had your menses because that in and of itself was toxic and impure. It was um, it was actually believed during a lot of the Middle Ages to be undigested food and it was putrid and toxic and you had to get that out. So the idea of having something inside your vagina that was going to absorb that was um, not healthy for the woman. Uh, and in fact, when they use pessaries, which I would caution people not to see a pessary, which looks a lot like a modern tampon because it's herbs, it's wrapped in linen cloth, it's wrapped with a string. Um, that was used to provide the medications into the vagina. And if you needed those medications so badly while you were having your, having your, um, your menses, they would actually create in a lot of cases, a different type of applicator that is going to be round like a donut. And they would use like honey and wax to keep it that shape. So it had a hole in it so that you could continue to flow and you would also get the medication. Um, the, the use of a sponge 
was most commonly what I have found. It's going to be towards the end and even a bit after SCA time period. So we're talking um, the the 1680s is probably the cap of when I've seen it. And then on back for maybe 180, 200 years. Um, that was used if you wanted to have sex while you were on, on, your, on your period, um, because that would keep all of it up and out of the way. And that was also seen as something that um, prostitutes certainly exercised that quite a bit. Um, and so it was seen as being kind of kind of slutty, but sometimes you just need to have sex when you're on your period, I get it. So I don't really think that they probably used anything like a tampon. Um, the moss, the blood moss, is um, something that certainly existed. And I have my own ideas and theories that I'm still trying to validate through the documentation about that being used in something like a sanitary belt. Um, there is an archeological find with an extant piece out of Scandinavia that I have been trying for quite some time to find the original archeological report that was done by the archeologist in the field in English that talks about the belt. It was made um, with animal skins and this moss and wool. Um, and because this was excavated in like the forties, they just wrote down that it was a belt, um, which I could easily go off on a tangent as someone who got my undergrad in archeology span and worked in the field as a field technician, that that is one of the issues with archeology span being almost entirely men for so long. I think we probably have extant finds that will speak to what we did during this time of the month when we had our cycles. But those things have probably been misinterpreted because they were found by a man who would have had no idea how we would have dealt with with our our menstruation, with with our bodies. And it probably wasn't important to them. Like it didn't mean anything too, right? It just it's something that they found. Uh, you said sanitary belt. Uh, do you have? I know that we've talked about this before. Do you have a particular theory about sanitary belts, or how do they look? Yes. I so, um, again, I'm using some documentation that's just a, a wee bit post FCA time frame. We, we tend to stop about, I think it's 1602, somewhere in there. Um, lots of documentation from Tudor England and then through the Stuart period um, that talks quite a bit about belts, especially, uh, and I can't think of his name now, but there was the, the poet. I will link it after class because his poetry about slutty women and the women he liked to have sex with was spectacular, talking about periods and poop and toilet paper and amazing things that we never hear talked about. Um, but he, he spoke a lot about the sanitary belt and it was described as something like a girdle that um, you would see around a horse. Um, this is as early as probably the 1400s. Um, and then they would take their clouts of linen, which is their cloth, and it would be pinned to the belt, um, much like we saw the sanitary belts in like the, the first half of, of the 1900s. So understanding that that may be hard, and this is why Adelheit is queuing up for this so well. She knows I have the prototype. <laughs> I know this would be difficult for people who maybe have never seen or heard of a sanitary belt. Um, I am going to demonstrate how to wear one. Before I lift up my skirt, I'm wearing pants. <laughs> clarify that. So I'm gonna adjust my screen a little bit and take a step back. So here I have, well now you can't see my face on all of that. It's a little weird. Okay. So here we have a cloth belt. And um, this is an, an unhemmed piece of linen. And if it seems large, I don't think it'll seem large to people who menstruate because this is gonna have to absorb without a leak. So I'm going to fold this into an appropriate shape. We'll use that. See if I can keep my skirt up out of the way. Clearly, I am very committed to leaning in <laughs> archaeology and menstruation research. 
So I'm going to tie the belt around my waist as it would have been worn under the dress. Now there's going to be a knot, and when I'm putting the skirt on, you're going to see the knot. I, I, I imagine um, this would be put on in a way that was much more discreet, especially since this was seen as a taboo to have your period. So then I'm going to take this and I'm going to use a pin. I don't know if you can see that. It's just a veil pin. There we go. And I'm going to pin it in the front. I'm going to be kind of lazy about it because I don't want to take too much time to get everything perfect. Tuck in the edges. This is going to go between the legs. And you're going to see it in the back, which I'm not going to pin. I'm going to tuck. It would be pinned, but uh, that's a little hard to do here. And now I am wearing a sanitary belt and I can put my skirt back down and that would serve as a tool to absorb while I went about and lived my daily life. That's, I, I love that. I just love demonstrations. So I'm very happy with that. Thank you for showing us what that would have looked like. Um, so while you're getting uh, unsanitary there, uh, I want to talk about uh, actually getting into the mid, uh, midwifery part about of this. So uh, the church, I, I find the hypocrisy of the church requiring um, how uh, obviously sex was handled, how even births was handled. And so now I want I want to kind of know why the church was so OK with um using what I would imagine is sort of pagan or what they would have occur accused us of witchcraft within actual uh, childbirth. So what, how did they allow that, those two things to interact and give us some examples of midwifery witchcraft in the context of giving birth? Yes. Uh, the um, is the incantations that after about, I would say entering into the high, high mid era, high middle ages, um, I wanna say it came out of the inquisition or around that time. Um, as soon as we started to see professional midwives, uh, we also started to get a lot of control from the church. Um, and in one way that that was exercised is that there were incantations that you learned when you were trained to be a midwife that you had to speak over the birth as it was happening at just the right time. Um, that is my word that I use, incantation. Um, just like, and what I'm about to say might be a wee bit controversial, I ask you to have an open mind, just like quite a bit of the chants and even the prayers, up to and including asking Jesus to come into your heart and therefore be saved from the lens of paganism and witchcraft. That sounds a lot like a spell. That sounds a lot like a charm or what I would call an incantation. So we see something like that happening that was imposed on midwives. It came out of the church um, that you would have to speak these incantations, which would often invoke the name of Jesus and the apostles and Jesus's protection and strength and love over the child, but you had to recite these perfectly because you walked a very fine line as a midwife being persecuted for witchcraft. If anything went wrong with the birth, it was because you were a witch. If anything went wrong with the fetus, it was your fault because you were a witch, because you brought evil in, because you were there under the pretense of helping to give birth, but you were actually there to harm the baby. Because of course, one of the major themes in witchcraft is, at least at, at this time, is wanting to harm and also eat babies. Um, so we would want to do all of the harm to all of the babies that we possibly could. And the easiest way to gain access to those babies is to be a practicing midwife. Um, if you said the incantation wrong, and there were at times clergy that would be present so that they could hear you and make sure that it was said correctly. Other people who were in the room, like the family, even the mother, depending on 
her point of view and life experience is if something went wrong with her baby, everything else was fine, but it was born as a stillborn, for example, or it had a cleft palate, then that was clearly because you said the incantation wrong. And now you have doomed me and my child. And that was a very quick way to end up in court being accused of witchcraft. Did they use talismans or any kind of objects to uh, help the birth besides incantations? I can tell you they absolutely used them to uh, help them conceive. That oh. was a very common theme, both in fertility, um, not saying it's fertility magic, but it sounds a lot like fertility magic. Um, and then also in contraception. So the main animals that that come up are, of course, the mule. That one's everywhere. I mean, the amount of I started to go down a rabbit hole of just mules in gynecology, and it's kind of mind blowing. I really need to do like a project just on the mule. <laughs> the mule and deer and the hair. The hair was also probably because of how they are able to procreate themselves. They were huge in fertility um, amulets and talisman, um, whatever word you, you prefer to use there, whatever makes sense in your brain um, to kind of get an idea of, of having a thing that was normally a piece of an animal um, in the instance of the hair cut out of the stomach um, that would hang on your chest. Um, it could be either partner really, oftentimes it was the woman, um, would would hang on your chest in between your breasts as you were having sex. And that was going to either ensure that you conceive or ensure that you do not conceive, depending on what you're going for. So for example, if you don't want to conceive, uh, one way that you could utilize a body of a, a poor mule would be to eat its uterus, and that would keep you from conceiving. Well, I feel really bad for mules. Um, so let's let's talk about worst case scenarios in birth. What did a midwife do if there? Well, actually, let me start with this question instead. Did Caesar actually was he actually born via C-section, and did they exist? And let's say again, worst case scenario, I'm I'm imagining the idea of cutting open a woman's stomach and womb was probably not ideal. So that has to be a worst case scenario situation to even think about it. So let's talk about that. Yeah, we're yeah. after about the time that there was no anesthesia, there was not a firm understanding of germ theory. Um, so it was it was not a time in which you wanted to be cut open for the fetus to be excised. Um, so I want to start by saying that. I own all of my determinations and assessments and opinions about cesarean sections in history because um, there's a lot of data out there that is it's not it, it doesn't align at, at all it's it's all over the place and plenty of historians have a lot of, of really very different ideas about time and place and use of cesarean sections. For me personally, I come with a bias that says that they were not used as we use them today as an alternative to vaginal birth. And in fact, I believe that they did not become an alternative to vaginal birth until about the 1940s uh, would, would be my guess from everything that I've read. So it is a common, I'm going to use the word myth, that Julius Caesar was the first C-section. Um, we know quite a bit about the Julii clan and his mom, Aurelia. Uh, we know that she was alive and well when she gave birth to him and that she had other children. And the reason why that is important is because at the time in ancient Rome, uh, according to the law at that time, the law was that you would only cut open a woman to, to try to excise the baby if she died in childbirth. And the reason why it came out of the law, I want to say it was originally called the Lex Regina, and then it became turned the Lex Cesera, 
which is, I believe, where the term came from, not from his name, but the law, which was named for him who was emperor at the time when he, um, let's say he renewed the law. That's how I think about it. Um, this was already a law in place. He kept it going. The name changed to Lex Caesarea under Julius Caesar. That law stated that a woman who died in childbirth could not be interred until they cut open her stomach to ensure that the child was not still alive. So this was done to, I presume, alleviate their own concerns that the child was still somehow viable since she died in childbirth. So presuming she had lived, it would have been born. Um, I It's very easy for me to think that this could have been successful and that's why they would continue to do it. I don't actually know the success rate. Um, that said, Pliny the Elder was the one who wrote down that Julius Caesar was birthed by cesarean section. Uh, there's a chance he could have been talking about another member of the Julii clan. There's also a chance he could have been just misquoted or had bad information. Um, so this was definitely something that was done, as you said, as a last resort uh, when the mother was either clearly dying or already dead. Would women have done this? Would it have been the midwife's job or did they bring in a man, a, an actual physician to come in and handle that? That's a good question. Um, from the images that I have seen out of the documents and the manuscripts, um, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a mix to see who was actually holding the knife. Um, I've certainly seen those who look like men and what that tells me, what that makes me think is that it's possible either they didn't have a midwife because not everyone would have had a midwife at birth. Sometimes your mom, your auntie, your daughter is the one who's going to deliver your baby. Um, or they had one, but either way, they called in a surgeon because a surgeon is going to be the one who makes the cuts. That seems perfectly reasonable to me. Um, are there some images of women being cut open, in my eyes, clear, clearly dead on, on, the, on the table, on the bed in these images? And it appears to be a woman who is holding the knife. Absolutely. It's, it's a mix. So we've talked a lot about uh, men, uh, women in the Middle Ages being uh, healers and physicians and all about the feminine anatomy and how it works. But I want to take a minute and just talk about you before the class ends or the interview ends. Um, why did you pick this particular area of study? What is it about it that really intrigues you and keeps you uh, learning and digging to find new and valuable information? This is something, it, it has been a passion of mine since I was pretty young. Uh, when I was a child, starting very, very young, I told my family, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a doctor. By the time I got to high school, that turned into when, when I grow up, I'm going to be a gynecologist. And then that further, by the time I exited high school was I'm going to be a gynecological oncologist. Uh, and then I did a very smart thing that anyone who is either young entering their first career or who is maybe thinking about a career change and that is i took time after school i went to a votech as soon as i turned 18 and i was old enough and i got a nursing certificate and i started to work in the field and i found that while there are a lot of things that i am incredibly drawn to in healthcare and hands-on care for patients I, I used to I used to be a hospice nurse um, that there was too much in the system that me and my personality could not work within. It was not the right career path for me. Um, and then in discovering the SCA, uh, I was already studying herbalism and historic herbalism and herbal healing and all of those things. And what I found once I got into the SCA is that this is an area of the the lives of people in the Middle Ages, well over half the population, at least half, close to half after the plague, far more than half, that is not heard in our hobby. It doesn't have a voice in our hobby. And this 
this this research has caused me to question in a positive way everything that i was shown about the lives of women in ancient and medieval times because it puts context and adds it it adds some nuance to every part of our lives including how we put our clothes on in the morning how we worked in the field how we worked in the city uh the fact that almost all of us if you lived after the plague and you lived in western europe no matter your age you probably did a stint every month at the stews we were all prostitutes to make ends meet we all did it to feed our families we worked we had economic agency and these everyday mundane things like how do you deal with having a period when there's no evidence that we had underpants in the middle ages that's going to drastically impact how you are able to interact and engage with the outside world as a woman so to me this is the most interesting and just fascinating part of history that i could ever possibly want to learn more about so if you had um a, a someone who wanted to research this wanted to get involved what avenues would you send them down where would you like them oh look i think i got the same question that jennifer rose just asked what where would you send them to to begin their path uh, without any more information than that, just sort of, you know, history of these parts of life, ways of women, I would point to two places. And these are the places that I won't say it's where I got my start because it took me time to find them. But once I found them, it gave me a huge jumping off point and springboard to really start what I do now. And that is um, housewife annuals of the Middle Ages, which interestingly enough, were often written by men of everything you need to know to be a housewife and what was really a lady of the manor. And then um, the Trotula, which is a three-part compendium. Uh, it was written by a woman who was trained as a physician in the school of Salerno in Italy. Um, and that, in my mind forms the basis of what would become obstetrics and gynecology so if you're interested in in those areas i would say get you the copy of the trotula it is edited by monica green she did the english translation i believe in 1984 it's still amazing uh and then i can absolutely link to tons of housewife texts from all over the Middle Ages and all kinds of geographies that show exactly everything you would have to know to live a day-to-day -day life as a matriarch in the Middle Ages. Well, Issa, I absolutely love this and um, I really appreciate you taking the time to give us a broad overview of uh, women in the Middle Ages and all of their physical aspects. But I want to give the people who are here some time to ask you some questions. And I'm gonna pop over to this chat and uh, just kind of scroll up if I can and see what some of the questions were throughout this interview. Um, let's see i appreciate not being stodgy who oh, i just skimmed past that thank you um so uh dexter asked if it was i said acid when we were discussing um the caustic chemical and he asked if it was alkali uh, maybe acid was the wrong description uh, uh can you answer his question he said acid or alkali when he was uh we were talking about the caustic not so great time for women trying to be burdens again yeah i think other substances as well, and I'm still sort of working through the translations for what they used to call them. But uh, for the ones that I have sourced, all, all of them were alkaline. So Her Excellency uh, asked uh, on here. She's called Wanda, in case anyone's knowing or wants to know. But uh, with the sponges that they use for contraception, uh, have used vinegar, and I'm going to point out something that I just remembered. Uh, uh, there's a show out called The Great, and while it's not historically accurate, one of the things they do is try to keep contracept or try to keep her from getting pregnant by sticking a lemon cut in half into her vagina. And I'm going to guess that maybe the idea is that acid would have stopped 
sperm from being able to be viable? 100%. Our alter pH is on the acid end of the, the, the pH scale, uh, which is interesting because that does, it does ascend sperm. So that is something that is one of those sort of interesting paradoxes in our our biology is that the the sperm have to swim really quickly because they're constantly being eaten by the acid secretions that that we naturally make and of course they're not so far on the ph scale that it that we are going to register it as acid uh, in in any kind but it absolutely is so that would 100 percent have worked i, I mean i'm not going to say it would have been totally foolproof but um <laughs> Putting, putting a lemon in, in your vagina is going to help to make the sperm not as viable. I would think too, because they did actually put, if I'm recalling correctly, it wasn't just the juice, they would actually put the lemon inside of it. It also potentially act as a bit of a, a physical barrier, almost like a diaphragm as well. I've got to imagine that if you're having sex with a woman that has a lemon inserted into her vagina and, uh, you know, you begin penetration, I have only to think that that must have burned like a son of a gun for that gentleman. And they had to have known it was there. (laughs) Maybe when you're lustful and passionate, uh, nothing will stop you at the time. (laughs) Um, So I I believe that uh, Joanna asked when we were talking about incantations and reciting particular phrases over the woman as she's giving birth. She wanted to know if any of them were the pleas maybe to marry the mother at the time. Did they did they use did they talk about Mary? And I know that there's a lot of uh, comparison to the Holy Trinity also being the mother, the maiden and the crone comparison as well so maybe maybe it all fits together i i believe that they did. um i will look back and see if i can pull any particular ones um out of, out of my notes that did call on mary but yeah you're you're spot on awesome well that's all the questions i see does anybody else have anything they want to ask her before we sign off on this i i of course i love women's lives in history so um Anybody else have anything they want to ask? I did type one other question. Oh, did I miss it, Esperanza? I'm so sorry. Where is it at, lady? Let me see. It's down at the bottom. Oh, oh, I see it now. Um, so, sh- well, you're on, you're on speaker. So go ahead and say, ask your question to her directly. Okay. Well. I was just commenting that no wonder it was written that vaginas were evil with men having sex with lead ridden vaginas that had to be like, not very pleasant. Hello, burning sensation. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And there was also um, really well-documented um, tactics is the word I'm going to use. I, they're well-documented that's coming out of the church. So I don't know if this was ever actually done. I think they were just trying to scare men into keeping it in their pants. But um, there was a lot of documentation written down, came out of the church. I'm thinking of um, Augustine in particular was one of the ones that loved to talk about the evil vagina and evil things that we do with our, our vagina to men. And one was to put not only lead but pieces of metal like shards into our vaginas so that we could then intentionally try to lure men to have sex with us and it would slice up their penis and then in doing so all of the vaginal juices and secretions are going to get into the cuts you can get a leprosy of the penis you can get cancer you can have these things happen and nothing ever, ever, ever is going to heal it. Um, So you have to be very, very careful of these evil, evil women who are going to try to get you to have sex with them just so that they can do horrible things to your penis because they don't have anything else to do. Yolanda asked if, uh, did they think vaginas had teeth? So, I mean, if you're sticking metal into your vagina, I'm going to guess that probably felt a lot like teeth or your perception was that it was a lot like teeth. 
you know, I have never researched the origins of the vagina dentata myth, but I'm gonna now. Because <laughs> I love the question. Um, I, I was just thinking, so uh, when they thought the vagina was evil, did they actually think the whole woman was evil, even her mental space? So they're having sex with her and, you know, obviously the devil's inside of her trying to make, uh, I, I, I guess I imagine it like the Adam and Eve myth, right? Eve caused all of our problems. And so her way to get you to do things is through her sexuality. Um, so did they think women themselves, their mental state was actually evil or was it literally just our vagina? I believe that absolutely believe that all of us was inherently evil. Um, and to make that leap back to Eve was absolutely present. Um, so it wasn't just that our vaginas were evil, but that that was sort of one place where our evil escaped. Uh, and it became worse when we were older. It became worse actually when we went through menopause because we stopped menstruating. So we're evil when we menstruate, but it's a necessary evil because we have to be purged. So when we stop our menstruation because we're older, it just, it goes off the rails because now we don't have any place for all of this ickiness to go because once again undigested food and it messes with our humors and that was made even worse and this was outright said in in the writings if she were of a lower socioeconomic class because she would have to eat things that are more coarse like her grains she wouldn't have access to good food and high quality food and that's going to make this even worse these are just the bodies that we're stuck with and they can't really do anything right. Um, we also have a question about how all the, tell us about the flying vaginas and penises and I'm gonna think pilgrim badges is probably what she's referring to. What were they actually for? So that there are people out there who are way more appropriate to speak to pilgrim badges because I have not done a deep dive into them. But what I can say, what I have read, um, which again is incredibly cursory, but people in the middle ages had like a super raunchy sense of humor. And the pilgrim badges are a fantastic example of that. Um, my peer, Mistress Beatrice, uh, likes to say that the Middle Ages are really just one big fart joke, and she's right. So uh, <laughs> even though they were handed out at churches, these are still real everyday people. And I think that that's a really good example of how there's going to be the stuff that the church says, how you ought to be and what you ought to do. And they're going to set a certain, we'll, we'll call it a standard. Um, but your everyday people are just kind of, everyday people and they like penis jokes now the flying penis comes out of ancient rome um so that was a um a fertility and a protection symbol um but certainly like the warrior vaginas which are some of my favorites um all of those there's also one that i really like to hand out that is a naked woman, or at least she's naked from the waist down, and she's squatting with her vulva etched into that badge for everyone to see, and she's holding a dildo. And if that is not real life of a woman traveler on the road, I don't know what is. Um, so... Uh I, I think that uh, I appreciate you giving a, us a moment about the uh, pilgrim badges when it's not necessarily your area of expertise, but uh, it was still good, I think, as a general overview. Um, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to ask. I would just like to thank you again for doing this. I know that uh, sometimes being the guinea pig and the first person to uh, try to, to do something new is often scary, so I appreciate that. Um, I would also like to ask the, those that attended, if you would send me any feedback about how this interview went, I would love to hear it. And I know that Issa, if you have any further questions or have any feedback for her as well, I know she would also love that. I'm going to put my email address in the chat box here for everybody. 
um, please, please send me ideas or um, anything that we could do further. And maybe we can get Issa to dive into another uh, piece of uh, his archaeological history that she knows about and go forward from there. So thank you all. Oh, Mary has a question about pain management. So what what is the question? How did they how did they manage pain? Um, so, well, especially during like um, menstruation and the pain of childbirth, I feel like it was kind of just accepted that like this was our punishment. But were there any um, attempts to manage that pain and what did they look like? That's interesting. So I, I know we are um, coming to the end of the, of the time and I think it's a really good question. Um, I have not personally come across anything to address pain um during one's period um i do know that they used opiates um and some of the pain involved in childbirth was absolutely included and attempted to be managed sometimes it's weird stuff like they need to eat sweet meats because it was also seen as if everything is a balance and you have your strength that you would be able to endure childbirth a little bit better. But yeah, they, they absolutely did have some options to, to manage pain. Um, I get the impression from what I've read that it's probably not as accessible as we would have liked and certainly not as accessible as, as we have today. But uh, yes, if, um, if you're having a baby in the Middle Ages, get you some opiates. All right, well, I, again, I appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great day, Issa. You're the best, thank you so much. And I look forward to the next one of these and the next time you and I can get together and try this as well. Wonderful, thank you so much for hosting us. It's great, I'm so glad this is going on. Thank you.